Well, I have to tell you, I have not sweat over a sermon this much in years. Midway through the week, I took a look at the question for about the umpteenth time, asked myself, who is Jesus, and began to feel quite irritated at whatever genius thought this sermon series up. (laughs) Who's Jesus? Well, here's what I discovered over the course of the week. I cannot answer that question for you. Jesus is relational. And the only way you are going to find an answer to this morning's question is to relate to him. All I can do is tell you who he is for me. That's the first of two preambles. The second is this. Midway through this sermon, I'm going to start talking about liberalism. And by that, I don't mean the contemporary usage, uh, political usage of sort of Rachel Maddow versus Bill O'Reilly kind of liberalism. Instead, as those of you who read the weekly email religiously know, I'm talking about the liberalism of the French Revolution and the American Revolution and the liberalism of the Enlightenment in Europe that wants to throw off ossified religious and political tyranny from our shoulders and discover the freedom that every human being has as a birthright. That kind of liberalism. All right. Two preambles. That means I'm anxious about this morning's sermon. So let's pray together. Please pray with me. Dear God, please be with us, for surely we need you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So who is Jesus? Well, if you were here two weeks ago for Bible Story Theater, you know the answer to that question. Jesus is Agnati, the actress, son of the living Sandra. Some of you can even do the genealogy begotten by Don and Anne. But if you paid attention to the reading that Todd just shared, you might suspect that if Peter had replied, you're Agnati, Jesus would have been confused. You get the sense from his response that there are wrong answers to this question and there is a right answer. And Peter gave him the right answer, Messiah. People who don't know him are speculating that he might be the reincarnation of some revered figure from Israel's past, Elijah or Jeremiah maybe, perhaps even John the Baptist back from the dead. But no, that's not right. Those answers are wrong. Who is Jesus, he puts that question straight to his followers. I'm not worried about what other people think. I want to know what you think. Who am I? Who do you say that I am? I want you to reconsider how you might be hearing his question. He is not a teacher giving a quiz, waiting for people to trip up and give the incorrect answer or reward them if they give the right one. He is not quizzing his disciples. He's asking them for something that he needs. Who am I? And Peter replies, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And at this point, I imagine Jesus leaping for joy like Tom Brady on the sideline last Sunday afternoon at that last minute interception on the goal line, thereby I have not just used the only NFL reference I'm going to use all year in the pulpit. But that was quite a moment. Pure relief. Yes, you got it. Joy breaks over him. All will be well. Jesus is overcome. Peter knows who he is. And not because Peter learned the truth or deduced the truth or proved the truth, but because God revealed the truth. To him. Jesus is the Messiah. He is here to bring us into right relationship with ourselves, right relationship with one another, and right relationship with God. He wants to save us. But that cannot happen if we don't recognize him, and we cannot recognize him. Most people who saw Christ face to face didn't see the Messiah. They saw a rabbi or a madman or a reincarnated prophet. And these were people who were standing right next to him. One of the things this suggests is that the modern, at least since the 18th century, modern attempt to figure out who Jesus was by using the tools of historical science and finding who the historical Jesus was and scraping away those bits of the gospel that probably look impossible to figure out exactly what Jesus said when he walked the earth. And if we can only do that, then we'll know who Jesus is. It suggests that that is an altogether doomed enterprise. People who stood right with him, walked along the same path, ate dinner with him, did not know who he was. We cannot understand him on our terms. 
Now, we might think the question, who do you think Jesus is, makes us a little squeamish or anxious because we're liberal Protestants, and liberal Protestants like to keep Jesus up on the stained glass windows at a bit of a distance. But on a deeper level, the question unnerves us because it's impossible to figure out an answer. Imagine being Jesus. He is here to bring us God's love. He is on fire with purpose. Have you ever woke up in the morning knowing exactly what you need to do that day? You got your list and you're checking through it and it feels so satisfying. Jesus can't do it. He knows who he is and he knows what he is here to do, but he cannot fulfill his purpose because we are blind to him. Christ himself says that books and teachers will not help us understand him. And that's how we understand things, through books and teachers. On our own, we have no way of answering this morning's question, no way of knowing who Jesus is. This is because Jesus brings us God. And God isn't knowable in the way we typically know things. Get ready, this is about to become very philosophical. God cannot be fit into our normal categories. You cannot say, I know what peace and power are, and thereby fit God into those definitions. As the theologian Karl Barth points out, you try to do that, and you wind up making the definitions superior to God. You may as well worship the concepts you're confining her to. See? Philosophical. Here's a way to drill into the idea and make it real. God is love. Nobody here is going to object to that statement. But how about this? Love is God. Well, that doesn't fit right. Not for a theist, anyhow. The categories we try to fit God into in order to understand Him cannot hold Him. God is always larger than our classifications, larger than our definitions, larger than our possibilities, always sneaking in behind our truths, always eluding our values and our concepts. That is why Jesus says Peter didn't learn who he was from books or teachers. We can't figure Jesus out. He's not a problem to be solved. The only way we can know who Jesus is is if and when God tells us who Jesus is. And that's why all of this is so exciting. Even on a snowy morning in the middle of February, it's exciting. It doesn't happen every week. Maybe it doesn't even happen every month. Maybe it only happens once every three years. Maybe you get the tools to let it happen outside of this place, at the dinner table or in your workplace. But through these stories, the mystery of existence is made clear. The power behind everything that is and was and ever well will be steps right into our lives to know us and to love us. So, the only way we can know who Jesus is is if God shows us who he is, drops the veil that exists between us, closes the gap. And at this point in his life, in this morning's story, 31 years old, repeatedly misunderstood, constantly confusing his listeners every time he raises his voice to speak, Jesus has got to be wondering if God is ever going to do just that. And then he does. Peter gets it. You're the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And immediately Jesus shouts back, God bless you, Simon, son of Jonah. You didn't get that answer out of books or teachers, but my Father in heaven, God himself, let you in on the secret of who I really am. And then here's what he says next. Very interesting. And that's not all. You will have complete and free access, Peter, to God's kingdom. Keys to open any and every door. No more barriers between heaven and earth, between God's kingdom and earth. A yes on earth is a yes in heaven. A no on earth is a no in heaven. The interpretation of that verse the one where Jesus calls Peter a rock and then says he's going to build his church on Peter and give him all of its authority. This is one of the key dividing lines between Catholicism and Protestantism. Catholicism, or Catholic doctrine at least, believes that the rock is Peter himself. 
and that Peter is the one person upon whom God is going to build his church. And from that, Catholic teaching gets the doctrine of the papacy, and then the doctrine of apostolic succession, which is to say the authority that one pope has to hand his authority on down to the next, and so on through the ages. It also gets the belief that the church mediates salvation, a yes on earth is a yes in heaven. So if the church says yes to you, heaven says yes. And if the church says no to you, heaven says no. Meanwhile, Protestantism believes that the rock isn't Peter. Peter is a broken sinner like the rest of us. The rock is his answer. That rock emerges any time and every time God reveals herself to one of Christ's followers. Any time someone grows to understand Jesus as the Messiah, the rock upon which the church is built emerges. It's going to happen again in just a few minutes, right up here. Miracles unfold. But what does that mean to say that Jesus is the Messiah? The word means Savior, which is to say that Jesus is the one who saves us. From what? Well, here's where those of you who struggled through last Sunday's blizzard to make it to church have a leg up. This is what we did to those good people who made it through the snow. They got to sit there and listen to a sermon about sin for 20 minutes. <laughs> Jesus saves us from sin. So what's sin? Well, sin, as we explored last week, is separation from God. It's the state that we live in. Sin is an existential condition, a grand cosmic problem, much bigger than the last bad thing you did. First, we are separated from God. And as a result, we suffer because of that cosmic division. We suffer an internal division, and we're separated from our own best selves. This is how you're able to know what you ought to do and fail to do it. Your better self knows, but the sin that is in you stops you from doing it. And as a result of that, we act cruelly. We live selfishly, both as individuals and societally. And as a result of that, we are divided from one another. So sin is this trifold state of separation. That's what the theologian Paul Tillich teaches. And Jesus comes to save us from this condition. He comes to reunite us with our own best selves, with each other, and with God. A good friend of mine recently spent a week lecturing at a college called New St. Andrews University in Moscow, Idaho. This is an Orthodox Calvinist college, one which proudly subscribes to a pre-modern theology. My friend told me that he was surprised to find himself in the odd position of having to defend modernity to a lecture hall full of college sophomores. He said he was tempted to win the argument with a single word, iPhone or penicillin, or electricity, or democracy, or the novel, or two words, human rights. It is ridiculous to issue a stem to stern rejection of the modern world. But it's equally foolish to pretend that modernity has not presented Christianity with a serious problem, or at least presented those of us, and I would count all of us in this room amongst this group, those of us who believe that one can be modern and Christian at the same time, we're presented with this difficult problem because, and we didn't know this back when Christian doctrine was originally formulated, but human beings are indeed capable of incredible things. That's what the Enlightenment has unveiled for us. That's what liberalism has brought to us. The iPhone, the novel, human rights, science, men and women no longer believe that we are broken, fallen, absolutely corrupted, totally depraved, as Calvin said. And here's the problem. The religion that we subscribe to, the language that we speak in order to know God, continues to tell us that we're saved. We think we're splashing around in the shallow end of some motel pool. But then you step into church and Christian song, Christian scripture, Christian story, Christian preaching insists that we're drowning in a storm-tossed sea. It's a bit of an overstatement, actually. Because even the most upbeat theological liberal still sees that humanity has problems, 
mysterious problem. But because liberalism holds that we're capable of solving our own problems with the right guidance, the movement took the fully divine, fully human Jesus Christ of Christian orthodoxy and reduced him to a very wise teacher, perhaps the world's wisest, one with the brilliance and the authority to make us mend our foolish ways. To overstate again, liberalism believes that the human problem is ignorance, and the solution Jesus brings, good teaching. So what I want to say right now is true for me. It's my testimony. It may not be true for you. It probably won't be, because, again, Jesus is relational. So all I can do, again, is tell you who he is in my life, and perhaps my story will function as a whetstone, and your faith can be the blade, and there probably ought to be some sparks and tension that result in the interchange, and that's how your faith grows sharper. So the Jesus I grew up with, the Jesus I grew up with, was the Jesus of liberal Protestantism. I knew what he looked like. There was a painting of him hanging on the wall of my Sunday school classroom. He looked like Barry Gibb, right? You've seen this painting, the, the Warner Solomon painting, with the blow-dried hair and the world's kindest eyes. And I was raised to understand him as the teacher. And he taught me, and he saved me, from myself at least. I remember when I was 23 years old, up in Minneapolis, making $250 a night, five nights a week, in tips as a restaurant bartender, and I was rich. I had three pairs of jeans I could put a pair on on Thursday that I'd worn on Monday, and I'd find $75 in the pocket. It was the greatest feeling that I ever had in my life. And a part of my job was throwing homeless men out of the restaurant's foyer. The restaurant was right across the street from a viaduct where people would congregate. So it was Jesus the teacher, the Jesus of my childhood, who found me on a 10 below zero January night tossing a homeless man out of the restaurant and into the dark. And this is the part where things got absolutely overwhelming for me, and I'm not exaggerating here. The man that I was hustling out the door looked exactly like that Warner Solomon Jesus. If you denied that man a bar of soap for a month and starved him for a couple of weeks, took his blow dryer away, he would have been that man in the foyer. So I'm moving him out, and right in the midst of this exchange, customers piling up behind me, I hear a voice, and the voice did not come from this man, and I didn't speak it out loud. It came from deep within my Sunday school memory, and the voice said, whatever you do to the least of these, you do to me. So I turned around, and I emptied my tip jar, and I placed all $250 in that man's hand. Two weeks later, I quit that job. Nine months after that, I found myself in seminary. And I have no doubt that Jesus saved me from myself, saved me into a life I could never have lived without him. And at that point in my life, in that first rush of real adult faith, I was convinced that if only everyone would let themselves be taught the way I was letting myself be taught, if only everyone would try to be good the way I was trying to be good, the world might well be turned around. But here's the thing. Two years after that moment in the foyer, I started working in a church, an internship at a large, fading, progressive liberal church that was really kept alive by the fact that it leased a lot of space to a very popular nursery school. My office was directly across the hall from the building's main entrance, which featured a gigantic foyer, and that foyer had a concomitantly gigantic radiator. The first day I was there, the senior minister sat me down, and he laid out a list of responsibilities. You'll teach confirmation, and I almost leapt out of my chair with enthusiasm. I was so excited to teach young people what I was learning from Jesus. 
you'll come with me on some hospital visits. And my excitement only grew. I was so excited to go speak and pray with sick people and let them know what I was learning. You'll serve on our social justice committee. You'll preach two times a year. And I almost jumped right out of my chair with joy. This is exactly what I knew God was calling me to do. And then in the winter, there are homeless men who just love that foyer across from your office. We can't have them there because of the nursery school. We can't be all things to all people. When they show up, you need to have them leave. Here's a photocopied piece of paper with some shelters listed on it. So it took throwing a homeless man out of church to make me realize that the Christ I'd been raised on was not strong enough to save me. But I needed much, much more than just another wise teacher. That if I was going to reconnect with God, it would not happen because I was good enough to get there. It could only happen if God was good enough to come to me and to accept me. So, if we believe that humanity's greatest crisis, the dilemma that we live in the middle of and reinforce and testify to and suffer from, can be corrected by Christ's teaching, then I think the Jesus of liberal Protestantism is sufficient. But if you suspect that our problems have a deeper, more enduring, indeed more wretched source, you might wind up needing a very different kind of Jesus. One who calls us to be better people than we are, and then loves us when we fail to become better people and then sends us back out and says, try again and keep on trying, knowing that you are beloved. A Christ who died in order to teach us how to live peacefully and then rose up again in order to bring all of us back into God's embrace. Because he knew that on our own, we could never do what we're commanded to do. That's the Jesus I found myself in desperate need of 17 years ago in that church for you. It's the Jesus I have found myself in desperate need of nearly every day since. And it's the Jesus that God gives me every day of my life, the Jesus I am growing to know, the Jesus I hope to live with eternally. And I thank God that I have him. Amen.